I'm excited today to be beginning this series that we call Be the Church. We, we have a, a pathway, a journey that we want every person here at New Life to go on. And, and you see it, you hear us talk about it once in a while. And that is that it begins with this idea of belonging to a family. We want this to be a place where people can belong to family, embrace community, the family of faith. But then we want you to experience what it means to believe in Jesus, to respond to the gospel, to surrender your life to Jesus. And then the next kind of step on that journey is to become his disciples, to become more like him, to live your life in the way that he taught, in the direction that he is leading and guiding you. And that pathway then leads us to this place. This is our goal for every person here, that you would then be the church, that you would be the church. And you might be like, well, what? I don't understand what that means. I thought we're in church, right? Aren't we in church? What are you talking about? But, but we see this throughout the scriptures. If you think about it, like the way Paul opens his letter to the church in Corinth, he, he writes it to the church in Corinth, right? And, and we see this idea in a statement like that to the church in Corinth, that even Paul, he, he saw the church was not a place it was not a building. It was not an organization or an institution. It's people gathered together under the banner of Jesus Christ. We have this in common, that we are the called out ones. We are unified in that Christ has saved us, but we are the church. So you didn't come to the church this morning. You are the church. And when we all kind of showed up here, the church gathered together. And our goal is here to equip you, to prepare you, to empower you with what you need so that you can go out and be the church in the world. Amen. And so in this series, we're talking about what that means. What does it mean to be Christ in this world? World And today I, I kind of want to lay a foundation for what we're going to talk about throughout this series. Because it all begins with this. If you want to be the church, we together, we must love God. We must love God. Jesus said this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love God with all that you have. Love God with everything in you. Because here's the thing that we see throughout the scripture. It's, it's the story of history, and that is that before you loved God, God loved you. God loves you. In fact, before I jump into my message, maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online, and, and maybe this is what you need to hear more than anything. Maybe you just need to be reminded today that God loves you. Maybe you've never heard that before. Maybe it's the first time you're hearing that and you're thinking that that just doesn't seem possible. Like, I don't think God could love me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the kind of life that I've led. And I am telling you, there's no doubt about it. God loves you. In fact, Paul writes about it in Ephesians 3.17. Paul says this, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, in the love of God, may have strength to comprehend. I love this. Paul is essentially praying for us, and he is saying, like, I pray that somehow, miraculously, by the help of the Holy Spirit, you would be able to even understand with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Essentially, he's saying, like, God loves you so much you can't even understand it without help from God to understand how much he loves you. You can't understand how, how big, how massive his love is for you, his desire is for you. So let's set that foundation. God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter what happened this week, no matter what choices you made, no matter what regrets you might be carrying into this place today, God loves you. No matter what may have been done to you, no matter what you may have experienced, what pain you may have gone through in life, God loves you. The question we want to learn about today, though, is how do we love God? How do we love God? And I want us to look at that by examining some of the barriers in our lives that keep us from loving God as he has called us to, that keep us from, from returning, reciprocating this massive love that he has lavished and showered upon us. The first thing is this, if you're taking notes, barriers to loving God, number one, I'm in charge of myself. 
It's the number one barrier. It's this philosophy. It's this way of thinking. It's this idea that I'm in charge of myself. What do I mean by that? That means that I look to myself as the primary authority for what is good and what is right in my life. Instead of looking to God, as, as my king, as the ruler, the leader of my life, instead of looking to God as the primary authority for what is good and right in my life, I'm going to be the one that determines that. I'm in charge of myself. In fact, if you think about it, this is the first sin that was ever committed. Adam and Eve, God creates the Garden of Eden. It's paradise. It's perfect. I mean, you think about your favorite vacation spot, kids. You think of Disney World on steroids. Eden far surpasses all of that. And God places Adam and Eve there. And sometimes we miss this part of the story, right? Maybe you're familiar with it or you know it from Genesis. But we miss that God then says to them, you can have everything you want. Anything you want. All of this is for you, right? Like God could have just given them sustenance. It could have just been like, hey, you've got something to eat. I've got oatmeal and bananas, and that's all. Oatmeal and bananas. But you'll survive. You'll be fine on oatmeal and bananas. But God gives them variety and beauty, and he creates all of this and, and, and gives them freedom and grace. All of it is yours, whatever you want. There's this one tree, and I'm asking you, don't eat the fruit from that tree. And we kind of know how it goes. Satan comes in, he tempts them. Hey, did God really say, don't eat the fruit? Yeah, did God really say that? I don't know if God really said that. And if he said it, this is the lie that, that, that feeds into our minds in the culture that we live in too. If God really said that, then, then God's like holding out on you. God wants you to miss out on something great. God wants you not to experience something that's going to bring so much joy and satisfaction into your life. And so Adam and Eve, they look at the fruit and they're like, yeah, it looks good. Maybe we will miss out on something if we do what God has told us to do. They eat the fruit. Sin enters the world. And, and we hear that story and, and, and we got to ask ourselves the question, why did God say don't eat from that particular fruit. Was he just being like a jerk? Was he just being mean? Like, what, what is happening here? Why would God be like, now this is here, you should not eat from it. Like, what is the deal with that? But look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Why did God say don't eat from the tree? The Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Why? For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Why does God say don't eat? God doesn't establish his authority in our lives to keep us from something good. We've got to understand this. God does not establish his authority in our lives to keep us from something good. God establishes his authority in our lives to protect us from something that will destroy us. And it is like a lie of the culture that has just come into the hearts and the minds of believers that somehow God's authority means you're going to miss out on something good and enjoyable when the reality is that God, in his love for you, you can't comprehend how high how long, how deep, how massive his love for you is. And in his love for you, he wants to protect you from something that will destroy you. Parents, you understand this. I have a son, Gideon. He's five years old now. By the grace of God, he has lived to be five years old. But, but when he first started crawling, when he first started crawling, this kid was obsessed with sticking his finger in electric sockets, right? Like, I, just obsessed with it. And so we've got all of ours covered, and it's safe. But I got friends, and, and they didn't do that in their homes, right? So electrical sockets, you go to the store, electrical sockets, it's church, there were some electrical sockets. And you just had to keep your eye on this kid because he would crawl and try to stick his finger in there any chance he got. Now, uh, we're a bilingual family, and so uh, the language from India we speak is called Malayalam. And in Malayalam, to say, like, I'm going to spank you is adi, right? You just say adi, and it means, like, I'm going to spank you. And I love that because it means... I can threaten my kids in public, and people don't know. Like people don't know what we're doing, and so what we would do: Gideon would crawl over to the electrical socket, and he's about to stick his finger in, and I would just be like, "Uddy, like Uddy, like, yeah, I'm gonna spank you, right?" And after a while, he would just look at me like, "You're the worst, man. You're the worst person." You're so horrible. Just let me put my finger in this thing. Like I'll feel great. And after a while, he started crawling over, and he would look at me, and he would say. 
Adi. Like, he's going to spank me. He's like, if you stop me, if you stop me from doing this one more time, I'm going to whoop you, dad. Like, that's his mentality. He thinks I'm trying to keep him from something good. He thinks I'm trying to keep him from something enjoyable. He thinks I'm just a killjoy who doesn't want him to enjoy life. And I'm his father. And I love him. And I don't want him to die. (laughs) And sometimes we forget that when God establishes his authority in our lives, that's his purpose. That is his desire. And we're just walking through life like, oh, God, I'm going to buck your way, and I'm going to not live under your authority. I'm going to be in charge of my own life. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I must know better. God is pretty smart. And God has laid out his authority to save us, to protect us from destruction. Now, here's the problem. All of us in this room, we would agree on this. There has been someone in your life who had authority, maybe a parent, uh, maybe a leader, Uh, maybe a a boss, maybe a teacher, a coach, some person in your life was in a position of authority and they were an idiot, right? Like they were terrible and they abused their authority and they mistreated you and they mistreated other people and they abused that position of authority. And because of that, we're just kind of wired to be like, I'm not going to let anyone else be in charge of my life, right? Because I don't want to get hurt again. And what if they got bad motives? And what if their intentions are bad? And what if that leads to pain again for me? But God is not like that. He establishes his authority so that we can experience what is good and right and fulfilling. We can walk in blessing. We can walk in understanding. Now, we understand that in our head, right? To disobey God, to walk away from his authority means that I'm I'm walking towards destruction and death. To live in his way means that I'm walking towards blessing and, and abundant life. We get that on our head, but it's still so hard for us to live that way. And here's something that I think is, is, is just creeping in to the church, creeping into the hearts and the minds of believers. It is There are a lot of people who say with their mouth, I love God, but their life shows that they will not let God be the final authority for what is good and right in their life. We can say with our mouth, I love you, God, but I'm in charge of my life. I'm not going to let you be the king of my life. I'm not going to let you lead my life. So a couple years ago, there's a group of pastors that that get together once a month. We pray. I can't remember exactly when this was, but a couple years ago, I walk into this lunch, and we're sitting around the table, and the topic of discussion is, you guessed it, the bachelorette. And so (laughs) I feel like I, I really want you guys to know I don't think any of us, I can't speak for the other guys. I don't watch The Bachelorette, all right? I just feel like everybody needs to know that. I don't watch The Bachelorette. If you're not familiar with it, the premise is you got one girl, like 30 guys, and they're all, you know, trying to be chosen by this girl. It's a stupid show, stupid show, but also you can see why it's very popular and everybody watches it, right? And so I know there's people in our church that watch the show too, right? Riri, she's over there, okay. But, uh, (laughs) But here's the deal. Here's why we're talking about it this particular day. It's a topic of discussion. The Bachelorette that season, the girl, um, if I was a good pastor, I'd know her name, but I don't know. So this girl is very vocal, professing Christian, and, and, and she's been very open about her faith, like, this is what I believe, and I love Jesus, and I love God, and, and that's been a vocal part of, of her life. And the, the I don't know, the, the scandal kind of on the show that season was that apparently this girl... Uh, was sleeping with one of the guys on the show. And not just kind of a one-time thing, it's like an ongoing thing. She's sleeping with this guy. And so, uh, and we know what the Bible has set parameters, God's authority in our life for sex is a gift that's given by God in the context of marriage. And so she's open about it, and, and she gets caught having an affair with this guy. And, and the scandal is because there's another guy on the show who also is this professing Christian. He's big, like, I love Jesus, I love God. And this guy comes in and, like, confronts her about it, okay? Now, granted, this guy was a jerk, and the way he did it, because some of you probably know, like, what I'm talking about, right? I'm not on that guy's side. He was a jerk, no compassion, no grace. He was not in the will or the way of God either. But he comes in and he confronts her. He's like, you know that as a Christian you shouldn't be, and da 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 he's going off, right? And her response is the reason We're talking about it at a pastor's lunch. Her response was, we all make mistakes, but Jesus loves me anyway. We all make mistakes, but Jesus loves me anyway. Now, here's why that's complex. 
because she's right, right? Like, like she is 100% right. I believe that's what the scripture says. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We all make mistakes. But for her as a follower of Jesus, as a person who's saying with her mouth that she loves God, for, for her to be unrepentant, no regret, just, just callous, I don't care, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, Jesus loves me, that's where it gets complicated. That's where it gets complicated. Because let's check it out. John chapter 14, verse 15, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will live under my authority. You will submit and surrender your life to my commands, understanding that every command of God is given for the blessing and the flourishing of human life. So, listen, as a church, this is not a place that condemns anyone. That's why I said the first kind of step in our journey is that we want this to be a place where everyone can belong to family. Absolutely. Before you believe, you are welcome to belong. We welcome you into this place. Regardless of your past, regardless of what regrets or baggage you may carry, we welcome you in this place. No condemnation. But we call you to believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, it means that, that, that something changes. Right? Your good works can never earn your salvation. But when Christ saves you and transforms you, it does change the way you live. So let's get back to John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And as a follower of God, to go through life and be like, I can do whatever I want to do, and Jesus still loves me, you might be right. He does love you. Absolutely he loves you. It's all over the pages of Scripture. He loves you. No question. No doubt about it. Here's the question I want to ask you. The question is, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? There's no question he loves you. Absolutely, he loves you. But do you love Jesus? Because he seems to say very clearly that the demonstration of your love for him comes in your willingness to surrender your life to his way, to his authority, to his rule, that he might lead you into life, into purpose, into flourishing, into goodness, into peace, into joy, into all of these things that he has promised. I found a great quote this week about this. Uh, it's a quote from John Cooper. Most of you won't know who he is, but Paul Fisher will know who John Cooper is because he's the lead singer of Skillet. And so it's a random place for me to find a very profound quote, but it was amazing. This is what he said. I'm amazed that so many Christians want the benefits of the kingdom of God with the caveat that they themselves will be the king. That's it. That's it right there. Eternal life, yes. Grace, yes. Forgiveness, yes. My sins are paid for, absolutely, as long as I get to do whatever I want. Right? That's how, that's how so many believers live. I'm, I'm speaking in love. I'm speaking because I want you to experience the life that God has called you to, and I believe that you will. But I firmly believe, and you've heard me say this over and over and over, that every command of God is given for the blessing of human life. I believe that. It's not to make you miss out on something good. It, God is not some kind of massive cosmic killjoy. He is a loving father, and to live under his authority leads you into life. It does, into abundant life and flourishing. Amen? Amen. You don't like when I preach this way. That's okay. <laughs> the second one is this. If you're taking notes, the second one is this. I am obsessed with myself. That's another barrier Another barrier to me loving God is that I'm obsessed with myself. We've added a new kind of word to our vocabulary in my lifetime. That word is selfie. I don't even know if that word was around before, but, but this is how obsessed we are with ourselves. I try to do research on this. It's actually hard to figure out. But, but Google says that just Android phone users, so we're not talking about any of you people with an iPhone, and I bet most of you have an iPhone in your pocket right now, but just people who use a Google Android phone take 93 million selfies a day. 93 
million selfies a day. There's nothing wrong with taking selfies, by the way, if you think that's where I'm going with the rest of this. There's not. I just thought that was interesting and whatever. And so here's the thing that we've got to remember, that, that, that we do live in a culture that is increasingly obsessed with self, right? I, I want to present this version of my life. I want you to be impressed with my life. I want you to be impressed with what I do and where I go and who I hang out with and where I spend my time and how I spend my money and how much money I have. Like we're, we're increasingly obsessed with ourselves. And, and the Bible kind of flies in the face of that. Because look what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But how do you do that? How do you live your life not doing anything from selfish ambition or conceit? Well, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. So in a self-obsessed, selfie-obsessed culture, the Bible teaches us to count others as more significant than ourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. And so here's where this kind of being self-obsessed keeps us from loving God. Because the Bible lays out for us that there is an order to our affections. There is an order to the way we focus on things and what we give our lives over to. And first in that order is God. Every single time we live for God, we focus on him, we worship him, we honor him. When Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name should be magnified. Your name should be glorified in my life, exalted and lifted high. So God gets the first place of order. And then the Bible is clear. Count others as more significant than ourselves. We put others first. So God first, then others, and then finally, we come into the picture, right? And and that's just not the way as a culture that we are wired. Am I right? And I think that keeps us from loving God. As a culture, we're wired this way. Not just I'm going to do whatever I want to do, but also I'm going to do what brings me happiness, comfort, ease, not going to get uncomfortable for anybody, right? I'm not going to get uncomfortable. So there's this term, uh, self-love. Have you ever heard anyone say, like, oh, I've just got to love myself for a little bit? Listen, there's no, nothing wrong with that. Because if you're talking about being emotionally healthy, physically healthy, if you're talking about being spiritually healthy, well, that's a good thing, and that's what God desires for you. You should be those things. But if the end goal of your self-love is just, I just want to feel better so that I can keep on loving myself, When self-love leads to selfishness, then we are outside of God's will and purpose. If the goal, if the intention of I'm going to take some time and and improve my my mental health and physical health and and spiritual and emotional health so that I can be replenished, so, so that I can have enough in my tank so that I can go and I can give and I can serve and I can help others and I can glorify God and I can point people to Jesus, if that's the goal with why you are taking care of yourself, it's a whole different thing, isn't it? I'm going to love God first, I'm going to serve his people, and then I'm going to focus on myself. And so, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. If anyone would come after me, let him love himself. No, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus is not saying that you shouldn't take care of yourself. He is just saying that you should live a life where you are replenished, where you are healthy, where you have everything you need. You've got enough in the tank so that you can pour out his love, his grace, his compassion, his kindness to the world around you. And, and our obsession with ourselves makes us, uh, it serves as a barrier between us loving God as he has called us to do. Here's a test that you can do. If someone were just to follow you around for two or three days, two or three days, they're with you all the time. They see everything you look at. They see everything you spend your time doing. They hear every conversation you have. Two or three days, someone follows you around. I'll sign up for this if you want me to. I don't mind. Like, it would make my job a lot easier if I knew what was going on. And so, like, if, if someone did that, at the end of that time, who would they say 
your life is focused on? Who would they say your life is all about? Would they say this person is constantly pointing people to Jesus? Glorify, look at him, look at him, look at him. I must decrease so that he must increase. Is that the mark of your life? Or after two or three days, would we just say, you know what? This person is like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's an easy test. That's an easy test. I don't know where you fall on that radar. Don't act like I'm just judging you. I'm just asking you to do a self-assessment and see where God leads you in that. Amen? You don't like when I preach this way. That's all right. We're going to go to the next one, and then we're done. (laughs) The third thing, the barrier that keeps us from loving God is that I am defining myself. I'm defining myself. I think we live in a world that loves labels. We live in a culture that loves labels. And I'm going to ask yourself this question. How do you define yourself? Like, Like if I've never met you before and we go out for coffee, And I sit down, and I'm like, hey, random, stupid question. How do you define yourself, right? Like, what would you say to me? Because there's a lot of labels you're going to put on yourself. And in and of themselves, they're not bad. You're going to say, oh, I'm a dad. I'm a mom. I'm a husband, a wife. I'm a a businessman, a lawyer. I'm a plumber. uh, I'm a sooner. I'm a cowboy. I'm an athlete. I'm a, a science nerd, like whatever. I don't know. Science people, you don't have to be nerds. You can just be smart. Sorry, I don't know why I said that. And so, like, <laughs> I, you're going to define yourself in some way, right? We carry all these labels. We, 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 we carry all these aspects of our identity that we use to define ourselves. Now, like I said, in and of itself, that's not bad. But I think the reason that can be a barrier from us loving God as he has called us to is that sometimes We ignore or we just forget the way that God has defined us. He has created us. He has given us an identity. And and, and he has defined you. So there are all these accolades and trophies and accomplishments in this world that you can use to define yourself. But you won't truly love God with everything you've got until you focus on how God defines you. So I'm going to read just a few of the ways in the scriptures that God defines you. This is what God thinks of you. And I just want you to sit there and let these things settle in. Let these things settle in. This is what God calls you. He calls you holy. All of you who are in Christ Jesus, who have surrendered your lives to Jesus, he calls you holy, blameless, forgiven, loved, chosen, You are called. You are set apart. You are a royal priesthood, a special person of God's own possession. My friend, that's who you are. You are an heir to the promise of eternal and abundant life. You are a critical part of the body of Christ. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are created in his image. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. You are crowned with honor and glory. That is who you are. You are his workmanship. He says in Ephesians, and that word literally means like like, like a work of art. His masterpiece. That's what God thinks of you. You are his masterpiece. A citizen of heaven. You are a new creation. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You are a light shining, new life giving, hell's gate destroying, victorious son or daughter of the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's who you, I was like, you better say amen when I'm done with that. That's who you are. That's who you are. And listen, guys, we we can go through life and we're chasing after this accomplishment and that trophy, and I want this label, and I want that label, and I want people to call me that, and I want people to see me as this. And sometimes we forget how God already sees us. And if we'll be defined by God, instead of going through life trying to define ourselves, if we will let him define us, I'm telling you, you'll be in love with him. You will love him with all that you've got. I think, I wonder, I wonder, If God is ever just looking at us like, oh, man, they're trying so hard to get all these trophies and accomplishments. They're trying so hard to win this and get that and get that. And and it's like they, they, they don't even see what I've already called them. They don't even care about the name I've already given them, that I cherish them, that I love them, that I care for them. And so to love God, 
I'm going to let him define me. I'm going to remember that, reflect on that, and walk through life with that knowledge in my heart. Amen? Now, we say all that, and you might be like, bro, this was a hard one. Like, I don't know. I don't know. This is pretty intense. Like, how could anyone? You're telling me that's how I've got to love God? How can anyone love like that? Who could possibly love like that? I'm glad you asked. I got the answer. Here it is. Philippians. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. This is talking about Jesus. This is talking about my Savior. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He wasn't going to define himself. He was willing to let go in some sense of the fullness of his deity. Though he was fully God, he was willing to let go of that. Didn't count it something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. You want to talk about bucking self-obsession? Jesus emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedient. Bringing himself under the authority, the will, and the purpose of the Father. Obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is how Jesus loved for us. And I'm asking, can we love him just a little bit the way that he was willing to love us, to give up his life for us, to die for us, to save us, to rescue us? That's how Jesus loved. And I hope that we would be willing to go home and examine these areas of our life. The question is not, does God love you? He loves you. Do you love God, and how is that demonstrated in your life? You know who else loves this way? Little kids. I'm sorry for using so many little kid examples today, for those of you who don't have little kids, but little kids love this way, right? Like, talk about Gideon. Gideon just, he just wants to hang out with me. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't want anything. Like, it's my job to feed him and clothe him, and I get all that, but he doesn't care, honestly. He just wants to be with me. Just wants to be with me. You want to talk about not self-obsessed. When I come home from work, Gideon could have been building something like all day long. He could have been playing with Legos all day, built this beautiful city. It doesn't matter. When I walk in the door, you know what he does? He just throws it. I mean, he just kicks it over. Like, I worked on that all day. I don't care. Dad is here, right? And he just runs to me like, Dad, you're here. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want you, Dad. I just want to be with you. I love that. That's how little kids love. Right? Sometimes I got to correct him. Sometimes I got to do this. He wakes up the next morning and he's just like, Dad, I want to be with you. Just comes back and hugs me. You know what everybody tells me? I tell them about that, my little five year old. And everybody tells me, Oh, enjoy it. You got to enjoy it. Right? In all seriousness, because they're like, when they grow up, it's just different. It's just different. They, 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 They get busy with their own stuff, they got their own things that they're focused on, they got their own stuff to deal with, and, and, and you'll love them. And they'll love you, but it just becomes different. It's just different. Then, Any of you know what I'm talking about? Any of you with older kids? Yeah. And I wonder. I wonder if God ever sees me that way. Oh, that when I first came to Jesus and when I first became a son of God, when when that first happened in my life, the way that I loved him with, with just reckless abandon, I don't care about anything. You want me to go into ministry, God? I'll go into ministry. I don't care what plan. I don't care. I don't care, God. I'll, it's all for you. I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. And I wonder if little by little, as I have grown up in the faith, if God is ever like, man, Jason, I love you. I still love you, but I miss you. I miss you. And I wonder if for some of you, if God would look at you the same way. You've been saved. You you are held in the palm of his hand. The Bible says nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. So he loves you. But I wonder if there are some of you where God would say, I just miss you. I just miss you. Would you return and love me? the way that I love you. That might be what God is speaking to some of your hearts this morning. And if he's calling you, I'm telling you, just respond. 
Surrender yourself to his authority. Surrender yourself to glorifying him every single day. Surrender yourself to walking in the identity that you have already received instead of going out there and trying to achieve an identity for yourself every single day. Rest in that. Rest in that. And whatever we become as a church, I pray that first and foremost, we would be a church of people that love God with everything we've got. Let's pray.